Hello, everybody, and um, welcome to this uh, second slot of the subsidence and deformation uh, uh, session. Uh, we have a slight change of program because the first uh, author has not uh, arrived yet. So uh, we will start uh, with uh, the second uh, presentation, which will be given uh, by Christoph Giesinger. Um, and um, I would like to remind everybody that you can post questions uh, for the authors in the chat. And uh, we will do the questions uh, at the Q&A session at the end of the session. Uh, Please, Christoph. Just muted. So, okay. Thanks, Ingvar, for the introduction. So, I would like to start this session now with a talk on our experiments we did with active C-band radar transponders and Sentinel during 2020, uh, 2020 in the past year. Um, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, which are from DLR, from DLR, and from TUM, who supported me in this uh, research. Okay, so um, the transponder principle is relatively simple, as you can see here on the view graph. So we have a device that is kind of uh, catching up the signal coming down from the Sentinel, or, uh, from the SAR sensor. It amplifies it and it transmits it back right into the direction where it came from. Um, these devices, they can do this for ascending or descending paths. Uh, you have to pick polarizations. Um, and they're usually built for a kind of frequency band, in this case, C-band. So they are support not only Sentinel, but also RadarSat in principle. And uh, they are relatively simple devices that only operate on time-based windows. So they have an absolute time from, from a GPS receiver, and then they, act, they do an activation window where they are, in principle, can receive and uh, retransmit the signal. So um, they can do this in very much the same way as two passive corner reflectors. So it is a much smaller dimension. They can substitute in principle two passive reflectors. And main design goal is for phase stability and insert applications. So they want to achieve millimeter phase stability. And now after quite a long of uh, prototyping and uh, initial development, especially by the colleagues from Delft, uh, there's now first of the shelf version of these devices have become available now by the company of MetaSensing. And uh, we at DLR, we have a small uh, setup that you can see on the left. We have two of these uh, transponders installed at our premises and uh, two corner reflectors, and we can look into them, what we can do. Okay, here you can see a little bit on the on the installation what we did. So first, of course, you need a, a license because these are active devices. Um, uh, in the end, we had not so much trouble, but the, the process could be simplified. So especially by the manufacturer to disclose a bit more details on the on the electronics. Um, and maybe also on, on the long run, maybe by, by ESA, by endorsing this kind of uh, devices, also as a Sentinel critical ground infrastructure. Okay, another thing we learned was the, the power supply, which turned out quite important. The devices, they have a buffer battery, but this does not last longer than one to two weeks. So supply is definitely required. Mounting, different concepts have been used also by other groups. So we use this uh, earth studs that we drill into the soil and we place frames to orient and uh, attach and detach the devices in a repeatable manner. And they also orientation can be done by usual instruments like compasses or other devices so that we can get around within a few degrees the northward orientation of the, of the transponder. Okay, and finally, the, the operations uh, turned out not too difficult. It's a bit of a clunky interface, but we can upload the time synchronizations, uh, the activation windows. This all worked quite fine, but we had some trouble then with the electronics on, in the long term operations. So, uh, the first device operated without many problems throughout the year, but the other one failed twice, actually. It got repaired, but on the, on the long run, it turned out really that the, that the ceiling of these devices uh, that you can see here running around the bottom plate here, the silicon uh, ceilings here, they, they tend to become loose and eventually will lead to wetness or humidity inside the device that may even damage electronics. So this is definitely a weak point at the moment. Okay, some impression from the installation. So we drilled here a bit these uh, studs into the ground. We place the frame, attach the device, and you can also see here the corner reflector, 1.5 meter type that we have for comparison. 
And uh, in the graphics here, you can see uh, throughout the operation year, um, just clock stability. So we have configured it to synchronize the clock every two days uh, with GNSS or GPS. And you see that usually the time is relatively stable. It only adjusts it for a few, one to two seconds. Uh, we had one event here that, where the device kind of uh, lost time by maybe there's a glitch in the firmware, we don't know. Uh, this was quickly recaptured in terms of time by the next resynchronization, but we got uh, an outage here in the housekeeping data by this event that only got recovered when we restarted the device sometime later. Um, we can also see that what is uh, locked here in the internal lock files, if we store them, so we get a temperature and relative humidity curve here for the housing. You can see this behavior throughout the, the year, so we can get quite large temperature differences between morning and afternoon passes, and also, of course, winter and summer. Okay, um, quickly on the data. So we have uh, three different stacks here at our test site uh, with S1A and S1B, six days sampling. Uh, so it's roughly about 60 scenes uh, in each of the stacks. Uh, we did a bit of an estimation of the radar cross section here. So you can see the number here for the corner reflector and, uh, and the transponders. So the transponders are quite a bit uh, stronger. So this would be an equivalent to about 1.8, 1.9 meter passive corner reflector. So this is good news. Um, so the transponders, they are quite bright and can even operate in, in regions or in, in locations where you have quite some background clutter. They're still nicely visible. Now for the for the analysis, we looked in three different topics. So the, the first one was the geolocation analysis. Uh, we did then also this uh, 3D absolute positioning that we can do with the SAR range and azimuth data. And we also did a quick experiment on the phase stability with the one year data. So coming to the first results here. So you can see here the geolocation where we compare the reference timing that we know from the surveyed position of the devices and the orbit uh, with the numbers we get from the star image. And uh, in between, of course, we have all these uh, disturbances like atmosphere and tides and system effects from the, from the satellite. So we know how to correct them. And you can see here in this uh, yellow uh, figure here, part of the, the results here, the corner reflector, which is quite to expectation here. So the usual few centimeters here in range course, a bit worse because of the coarser resolution in azimuth in the, in the azimuth direction, but still nothing to worry about. So this is quite in line with all the other results you're seeing for corner reflectors and Sentinel-1. Um, but for the transponders, we see here a very messy picture. So in principle, we would expect the same results, but we see here uh, first for the uh, ECR 112 here that we have really smeared out data across all this different uh, range here because this was uh, the repairs considerably changed the electronic behavior. So this was definitely not good for the for the stability. Um, but even for the for the second one that operated throughout the year, we can see a clear difference between what is ascending data here on the right hand side and the descending data. So the two amplification chains, they're definitely not behave the same way. So this is definitely a problem and we can do this also in a bit on a wider scope. So in uh, in this project here, we have uh, installed uh, 10 transponders throughout the Baltic Sea area. Also, most of them have quite accurate uh, GNSS coordinates. Uh, they are co-located even with, with GNSS receivers in some cases. Uh, and here on the figures, you can see a very simple, uh, similar view like we had on the previous slide. So again, the, the offsets in range and azimuths from the geolocation but here sorted according to incidence angles. So what you can see here are essentially the different stacks we have at all these different installations. And you can also see, of course, that this picture is quite messy here. So we spread from one meter to up to three meters, depending on the device, we see difference between ascending and descending. And of course we have the noise here as most data, but in, in terms of systematics, it's actually doing better than the, than the range data. So if we do a bit of a, more cleaning up that we just take the average of all of these uh, different stacks uh, as an estimation. Uh, this becomes well quite accurate in terms of, of the confidence. So this is usually these numbers are good within a few centimeters. So this is definitely telling us that what we observe here between the individual sites and the measurements here, this is significant. So what we what we measure here in this experiments, uh, and we can really see here then between the different installations that. Many of them are not even flat across the incidence angles. We see variations here 
Um, so the, the basic message here is if we want to go further, we need to do something. So this something in an, in an initial test was just fitting a linear delay model over the, the incidence angle to at least remove uh, some uh, major problems here with this, uh, this uh, modeled delay numbers here. But on the long run, if we want to do it better, we have to definitely look into the uh, calibration of these devices one by one. Okay, coming to the 3D localization. So now we don't take the, the position as known, but we really use the, the measurements to pinpoint uh, by geodetic or stereosar methods, the, the position of these devices. So what I'm showing you here is the first result using only the ascending data because we can directly compare here the corner reflector at DLR premises with the two transponders here. So we see from the dual ascending setups here, of course, we have more problems here with the, with the 112 because of its behavior with the electronics and repairs. But we see here, we get some decent results already with 113. And the corner reflector is, of course, doing much better here. So in terms of offset, we are just in the DC meter range here. Absolute independent coordinates from SAR with respect to GNSS. And also the stability. So this is already kind of geodetic great coordinates in the uh, 10 centimeter level here. But the interesting thing is, of course, you have more geometries with the, with the transponder. So we can also bring in here now the descending information. And then especially for the for the 113 and the continuous operation, we can see here a very, very balanced result already for about five centimeter precision here. And yes, we have the offsets here in the in the absolute difference because of this uh, the different delays we have on all the geometries. But in principle, if we can solve this, we would see here definitely geodetic coordinates on the order of two or three centimeters. Okay, finally, quickly, the results on the phase analysis. So we also did the diff double difference uh, analysis of the corner reflector and the transponders. Um, so you can see here on, in the figure here first, uh, the raw results, uh, just doing the double difference here in gray between the corner reflector and the transponder. And we are seeing a little bit of seasonal and trend effects uh, throughout this one year of data. But since we're only were interested in the principal noise of the observation, we just estimated and removed that. So other results have shown that this is might really be related to, to temperature variations throughout the year. But at the moment, we just simply remove it and look at the noise that remains uh, in the red curve here. And this is around one millimeter equivalent uh, phase stability. Two minutes. Is quite comparable with the results we also get from the from the two passive corner reflectors that I've shown you in our setup. We can do the same exercise there, and we also end up with something like one millimeter stability. So in principle, the the phase stability is given when we look into this from for a single geometry. Um, we will have to look a bit further and see if this really will work out for for more than one year. Okay, coming to the conclusions. So in, in principle, we can operate these devices. We can get the transmission licenses if we convince the authority. Uh, power supply is definitely needed for, for long-term operation of the devices. The weather ceiling has turned out to be a critical point. So this is something that needs to be addressed by the manufacturer if you want to operate them now for years in the field. Um, the the time-based methods, I've shown you the results, they're really suffering from the delay behavior, so this needs to be addressed. Uh, phase stability in this first uh, test has looked quite promising, um, but we still have to, to look into this in the in the two to three year time frame if this really will work out. I mean, we know from the passive reflectors, they can operate in the field without problems for decades. So we have some of them in the field now for 10, 15 years, and uh, we will see if the, the transponders can be brought up to this uh, level. So the, the research we are doing here, this is also contributing to this uh, Baltic Sea uh, investigation we are doing here with our partners uh, from the different countries. Uh, if you want to look, uh, want to know more about this, you can look here at the publication that we did earlier. And yeah. To, to conclude this, some, let's say, final one recommendation from my side would be that also such kind of, of infrastructure and, let's say, stable installations 
that they are endorsed also by ESA and by the agency as kind of sentinel critical ground infrastructure. And then if users want to put up such stations uh, in a geodetic grade environment, collocated with other devices, that such activities are acknowledged also by the by the agencies and maybe obtaining transmission licenses. And uh, these kind of things are kind of supported and tied to the to the Sentinel mission to, to make this more visible and uh, encourage operators in the different countries to establish such points because i think in the future they really will be needed to to bring together all the all the information we get from sar and in service other geodetic infrastructure okay so this is was it and thank you yeah thank you very much we are uh, just on time uh, there is no time for for question will be at the end of the session uh, we are able now to move to the first presentation which uh, which is given by nantera uh, is a contribution from the university of bristol and the university of leeds hello nantera. hello can i'm sharing my screen Everyone's saying okay? Yes, it's okay. Uh, yeah, first of all, I'm sorry about confusing time zone, that's why I'm late. Um, hi, um, I'm Bui. Uh, actually, like everyone call me as a nickname. And uh, actually, my the whole full name is Nantila Nantrasi Chai. Um, uh, here, I'm presenting our work that apply the popular deep learning technique, uh, which is the convolutional neural network or CNN, um, to detect ground deformation in the built environments using inside data. Um, this is um, a cooperation between University of Bristol, University of Leeds, and um, funded by a uh, nerd digital environment. Um, this work is based on our previous work that um, successfully used machine learning to detect fringes in um, wrapped interferograms. The left image showed our framework that trained um, AlexNet to classify um, volcano um, deformation and um, background. The incoming interferogram here is will divide it into overlap patches and run through the CN model that trained um, to produce the probability map as shown in the um, right hand side here. Um, so this is the latest eruption event that uh, the framework uh, detected. It's the Mount um, Raikakunko, I hope I pronounced correctly, that around like now 400,000 people have been evacuated from the red zones. Um, now a little bit of the um, recap of how CDN works. So it captures spatial relationship among the um, neighboring pixels. Um, to the convolution operators, as its name. Um, when we look at the um, interferograms at the volcano here, we can see that this volcano um, have the dense pixel, and the fringes here, for example, is the very strong features for um, classification. So, however, when we look at the signal that we wanted to detect of ground deformation in the UK or about the urban environment, like this velocity map of a, um, London, the data are sparse and there are gaps between pixels, um, which is not suitable for CNN. Uh, moreover, as it used different techniques to capture INSA, the data contains spike, spiky noise. Um, we also face another problem. We don't have good label data and what we want to detect appear to be slow and um, localized. So we tackle these problems with these three proposed techniques, so which is the um, spatial interpolation to deal with the sparsities, um, using the synthetic data for training and um, applied um, overlapping to uh, detect slow motion. Um, for the first technique, we saw spatial uh, interpolation using an inverse problem, follow the first equation 
here that we want to find x um, from the observed signal y and subsampling metric x with some noise n. The algorithm tries to minimize the cost function shown here. Um, it solves the row rank matrix using the um, singular value decompositions and apply soft thresholding to reduce some noise. So this is a sample um, of the results um, at the um, Norman um, in the UK. The top left is the low sparse data and the bottom left here is the interpolated results from the um, traditional uh, triangular method. Um, it's, you can see that even though the, um, the, the gaps have uh, been filled, but this noise is also enhanced. So compared to the our method on the right hand side, it appears to be a smoother and also reduce the noise. And this showing um, that uh, velocity rapid to produce the fringes. So then that's suitable for a scene and to be detected. So it clearly show that um, the our method show the um, better um, in terms of visualization on the fringes. It did also um, uh, apply to the uh, CNN as well. Um, next, this is the, another technique that we used for um, I'm dealing with the problems that I talked before. We used the synthetic data sets so, um, to, to, to train the CNN model. So we produced two models, which is the point source for the coal mining subsidence and the tunnel model, which is for the, um, uh, the, the to see the lift um, and the, uh, the subsidized because of the, the long tunnel when they uh, have the tra uh, real training and construction. So the top row um, is the unwrapped the signals and the bottom row is show the wrap version correspond to the top one. So because we, when we create it from the uh, unwrapped data, so that, then we rewrapped it to use it to, 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 uh, to show for the fringes to, to, uh, for the scene in. So we combined the uh, deformation with the turbulence uh, uh, signal, um, uh, D plus T here, and then we subsampled it and add some spiky noise, which is exactly the same um, characteristic show in the real data in the UK. And then um, we um, interpolate it to get the training data set, which is actually the, the uh, last uh, column here. This is show example that if you just use a, a traditional a training room, we got that enhanced the noise is not true. So we use this this one actually as well for training. Um, and the last proposed technique is the overlapping technique um, with this. Uh, to deal with the slow and localized um, motion. You can see here, this is in the method to find is the, the phase or, or velocity, and then um, we apply some gain here, and then we rewrap it again. And again, if uh, there's a suggestion, the user one, two, and four, and eight again. So this figure um, and the plot that show how CN can detect the original signal with the different level of noise. So it is the clean noise, my noise, and um, the higher noise. And when the gain apply, you can see it here. So you can see that the, the, after um, we wrapped it, the fringes is actually um, more, show more fringes that are easier to detect. So if you look at the, the, the my um, uh, here, uh, the my noise. So the first, originally, the, the level to be detected set the uh, probability to um, uh, 0.5. So first it takes it about five, um, about five centimeter, Oops, sorry. But after they apply some gain, so the threshold did move. So then we, the method can it take a lower, lower change it now about uh, 2.5 here, for example. However, um, this is have to, to be careful because if you have high noise and when you apply some gains, that, well, that means when you wrap the gain, this noise that could also show some fringes. And that means the, um, the CNN can be confused. And that's why you can see here the probability is um, lower than it should be. So what happened here? So we use all this um, gain that applied, so one, two, and uh, four, and eight. And then the final result, so we combine all this and average it. We should show um, 
a robot net that use only one of these um, the game. Um, this is show some of the results that we run to uh, two two cases. So at the moment that you can see um, this the the um, the ground is moving because of the coma in the past. Um, the red bit is the subsidence and the, the blue is the, the uplift. Um, this is the, the law example and after we apply some interpolation and this is the result out of from the um, uh, the CNN to meet the probability. So higher probability means that area um, are uh, more deformed. So um, we make like a, the, the contour here to, to, to show that. And this is uh, the, the, um, the case in London, which is the, the graph that moved because of the Northern Light extension. So um, quite, so quite, quite clear on the, on the, um, interfer uh, on the uh, velocity map. And uh, this is the, the overlay of the, um, the probability map to the, um, to the, uh, the real signal. So the, the red contour is where the probability more than 0.8 and the orange contour is the where the probability more than 0.5. So now we run the detection method on the whole UK data from uh, SatSense, um, which is a 10 meter velocity map resolution. Um, there are more than 90 million data points. Um, this is more than like uh, 3,200 full HD TV combined. So that's why the machine learning is very really helpful here. So it's, but it's impossible to go through all this uh, manually. Um, to automatically process um, for this uh, velocity map, we, pro, uh, we divide it into the several um, patches, which is the like 2,500 uh, 2, by 2,500 maps. This is because of the limitation of the memory that uh, we have in our the, uh, high computing system, because the, the, the holder is too big. So the figure shows um, the center of the location where seen in the detect um, from the uh, after being a uh, deformation. Okay. Um, so the result showed um, mining region from the uh, mining regions like in the area of A to F. Um, A is the midland up to what leads B in the South Wales, um, and C Northman and blah blah blah. You can see it here. Um, in the northwest of Wales, of the earlier I example, that the method detects the subsidence from um, some of the formal slate queries. And area G um, shows the uplift of the ground, um, of the ground water because of it rebound after the construction of the uh, cross rail them after it finished. Um, so, and this uh, we should analyze of the detection performance by the uh, plotting the histogram um, against the probability. So we show as expected that the low probability got low probability and you got some of the high probability here because of the deformation, um, for example, over there. And there are also some uh, spiky noise that you can um, we can see it here. Let's speed up a bit. And um, now we just like uh, compare to show um, from the histogram um, of the previous slide that you know, we set the threshold at the three, uh, three, four point five and five millimeter per year to classify for slow, medium, and um, fast deform uh, deformation, and apply the thresholding technique to compare. And you can see that if uh, the threshold, um, the thresholding technique generates significantly more positive points for the expert to further um, investigate. So it's about um, uh, 258 area to 4,000 for tip comparing. Um, so there are still some limitations um, for the CNN to, um, to, to do this. So we can say, say here that the landslides with the significant horizontal motion were detected on the south Kirby Stephen, um, but the method didn't detect the, um, the, the black bear landslide in the west of the um, uh, the door set here, so because not to supply and also as not supplied, the pinhole hole cannot be detected at all because um, their spatial characteristics are too small and it can be seen as noise. So um, for future work, that, look, the work that we're working on now is we're going to deploy the time series 
and also um, try to get the, the data at the data cube. So we have a spatial temporal analysis on the inside data. It obviously give the um, more information of the graph formation um, for the future work. So um, for wrap up, so, so here um, we demonstrate the feasibility of using a CNN approach to detect graph deformation in the urban or semi urban area in the UK. Um, we analyze characteristics of the, of the data and uh, propose several adaptations to the previous um, adopted deep blending uh, method. And metric completion is used for overcome the spots and uneven measure distribution and um, reduce spike noise. And synthetic example based on the point source and tunnels are used to train the model um, because uh, it, it, we don't have the real signal of the deformation and nobody labeled it for us, of course. Uh, and finally, the overlapping and the phase chip techniques are um, employed to enhance the features and hence reduce the, um, the, the uh, detection threshold. So obviously, um, we can use this as a prioritize for the future analysis. Thank you. Uh, I can have, can I stop sharing? Sorry. Uh, how can this? You stopped sharing already, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know why it's just pop. Okay. Um, should I still sharing my screen or? Any questions? Ingvar? Hello? No, so, at the moment there are no questions. Yeah, please, Ingvar. So, uh, before we move on to the next presenter, uh, I would like to remind the audience that uh, you can ask questions for the presenters and please uh, indicate uh, which, of, uh, which presenter you want to ask a question. And we will do the questions uh, in the Q&A session after uh, all the presenters. And this is on the Slido Q&A uh, panel that you should have uh, in, in your umbrella uh, view. And um, then we move on to the third speaker, uh, which is uh, Sohel Banyani from University of Twente, uh, please. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Sohel Banyani. Today I'm gonna give you a short presentation on a study of land subsidence in Tehran with Sentinel-1 data, geological investigation and GPS analysis. Next slide, please. Yeah, the recent identification or as a follow provides a straightforward way to evaluate land subsidence in southwest of Tehran, employing INSAR time series analysis for processing views PSI method. And finally, we validate the INSAR result with the GPS observation and interpre interpretation with the geological data. Next slide, please. As you probably know, land subsidence occurs for a variety of reasons. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, in terms of our extraction of groundwater, when the water is removed, the water pressure is consequently reduced. Without the water to hold up the weight of soil above it, the aquifer layer become more compact as a result, land deformation happens. Next slide, please. Good. Our extraction of groundwater for agriculture and industrial activities is a main reason of land subsidence in the Tehran Plain. And you know that uh, land movement can lead to significant economic losses. Therefore, continuous monitoring should be considered. Next slide, please. 
The study area is located in southwest of Tehran, the capital city of Iran. Next slide, please. Good. Let's move on to the data set. To survey land deformation, we use uh, Sentinel-1 SAR imagery and GPS observation for validation and uh, and boreholes and piezometer for validation. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this is a proposed method. Um, the, this, uh, the input of this uh, flow chart is SLC data, and the output is deformation map. I divided this flow chart in two parts. First, pre-processing, we use SNAP to SNAP Python code, and for processing, we use STAMPS MATLAB code. And after the formation map, a validation with the permanent GPS data and interpretation with geological data. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this is a final result. This uh, slide shows the deformation map at the southwest of Tehran. A negative displacement value present subsidence. Next slide, please. Okay, let's move on to the validation. Uh, for validation, the, the methodology which was used uh, for validation is double different. And the concept is that because uh, there were no PS point at the location of GPS points, at the first step, we were calculate the PS point at the location of GPS point by cridging method. At the second step, uh, two GPS points subtracted corresponding to the PS acquisition time. And um, we use this method for the PS uh, points as well. And in this slide, you can see the final result. The red circle and the blue star line in the case, the vertical displacement of the GPS observation and PS points in each epoch respectively. And moreover, the green line indicates the difference between GPS and PS data. Next slide, please. Good. Uh, the histogram shows, uh, shows most data are in the interval of minus one and one centimeter, and the RMSC is 12 millimeter. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, in this map, this map shows the location of boreholes, GPS points, and piezometric wells within the area of interest. As I mentioned before, we have two GPS points for validation, and also we have eight uh, um, piezometric wells and the five boreholes for interpretation. Uh, we can see the location of uh, them in this map. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide uh, shows that all piezometers uh, shows a decrease in water ground river for agriculture because of over extraction of groundwater for agri uh, agriculture and industrial activities in Tehran Plain. Next slide, please. This is a final uh, table, uh, shows the correlation between PS, piezometer, and borehole. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have five borehole, and in the first location, I mean the solve. The soil type here is completely clay, and the upper load here is maximum. Therefore, we have, we have a maximum amount of uh, subsidence in this location. I mean, we have 22 centimeter subsidence in this location. For the second uh, location, the soil type is uh, clay as well. The upper load is less than the first one. Therefore, the PS result is less than the first uh, location. I mean, we have uh, approximately 19 centimeters subsidence in Sabasha. But about. The soil type is a uh, silty sand. The upper load is uh, is almost a half related to the previous one, and the 
PS uh, result is uh, less than the second item. I mean, we have 13 centimeters subsidence in this location, but in district 80, although the upper load is higher than the third one, I mean the Bardabad, um, the PS result is less than the uh, third item. Uh, so another uh, item should be considered. Uh, it seems that this GW layer, I mean the well-graded uh, well gravel, um, well grade gravel uh, has caused the amount of subsidence to be less than the previous item. So in this location, we have nine centimeter uh, subsidence. Uh, for the uh, Shahriar, um, the soil, um, although the groundwater dropped in this location, no subsidence observed in this location because the soil tapia is completely in gravel and in gravel there is no compressibility. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Um, this slide shows a cross section for the salve completely in the clay and in the, um, in the sabasha in the clay and actually from the district 18. As we can see GW layer here, because there is no compressibility, GW layer here uh, plays a wider role because in this GW layer, there is no compressibility, but in the clay uh, layer, there is a compressibility. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is for a uh, Shahriar completely in gravel. And as I mentioned before, in the gravel, there is no compressibility. Therefore, in this location, although the um, ground water drop, no, no subsidence observed. Next slide, please. Hello? Seems that we have lost uh, our presenter. Can you perhaps read the conclusions out loud? Was that chair? Yeah. So the the conclusions are that uh, to assess the effects of ground deformation in Tehran, the PSI technique was conducted in the period 18-19, and the maximum total subsidence exceeds 22 centimeter in the line of sight. The PS results matched well with the GPS observation, and the primary cause of the land movement is the over extraction of uh, underground water find degraded, degraded material background is more susceptible to ground deformation than the compacted the gravelly sediment. Nevertheless, the amount of soil, press, soil pressure plays a vital role in the fine graded layers. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so if there are questions uh, for this uh, presentation, please write them in the slider in the umbrella and uh, we will let the author know about these uh, questions. Okay? Yeah. Sorry to... For the moment, there are no questions. Uh, I, and probably there is also not the presenter available. So uh, we probably can move to the fourth presenter, which is, uh, uh, sorry, the fourth presenter, which is Freck on, uh, Van, uh, Van Leyen from the University of Delft, the Technical University of Delft. Please, Freck. Uh, thank you, Michaela. Yeah, and good afternoon, everyone. 
everyone. Uh, my name is indeed Frank van Leyen, and I would like to uh, tell you more about the methodology we developed uh, together with my colleagues uh, for the integration of uh, different INSAR data sets, but certainly also with other types of uh, geodetic data. And just as a recap to start with, why is this a, uh, a problem? Uh, basically, because uh, geodetic data, they are uh, complementary, but uh, certainly also different. So what we observe is that, for instance, um, these measurements are typically taken at different locations. Eh? So the location of the measurement is different. Um, it's done at different, different epochs. So the moments of the measurements is, are uh, different. Uh, typically at different time spans. Uh, with different reference points or geodetic datums, uh, like uh, let's say reference systems, um, difference in sensitivity direction, and thereby by I mean that, for instance, with leveling, you measure uh, height differences in, uh, let's say, up-down direction, whereas with the GPS, you measure three-dimensional positions, and with uh, INSAR, we measure in the radar line of sight, so a three-dimensional uh, vector of sensitivity. Uh, so these uh, uh, directions are, are uh, different. Um, also, of course, uh, the associate, uh, associated accuracies, precisions, and, and, and biases are, are different. Um, and you will see that uh, all these data sets will be provided in different data formats. So uh, each processing tool will generate a certain data set with a certain, uh, in a da certain data format. And if you want to integrate those different data sets, um, typically you have to uh, do a lot of uh, efforts there. So uh, just to illustrate uh, what I'm talking about, so here are examples for three different techniques, uh, leveling GNSS, which could also be uh, GNSS in campaign mode uh, and, uh, and INSAR measurements, which have a typical sampling, which may range from uh, something in, uh, in the order of uh, uh, seconds, to uh, two years in case of uh, leveling. And INSAR, of course, is somewhere in the middle where we now with Sentinel have a repeat cycle of uh, six days. Spatially, uh, we have something similar. Huh? We have a, a, a strong difference in, uh, let's say, spatial density of our uh, measurements. This is a picture I took from uh, one of our earlier uh, publications. Uh, where you see the distribution of uh, not only uh, INSAR uh, reflection points in black, but also leveling lines and the location of uh, GPS, but also gravity measurements. Huh? So gravity uh, also provide information about potential uh, ground motion. And also, uh, this is also something we would like to uh, integrate. Now, because of this, um, uh, situation, um, we uh, were looking for an, a generic me methodology to actually integrate these different data sets. And this, uh, this is what we call the integrated geodetic processing uh, project, let's say. And the idea is to uh, uh, create something that enables us to uh, include all available geodetic data we have for a certain location and uh, time span. And the overall objective is to be able to estimate a displacement at any arbitrary location and time. Huh? So these may not be uh, uh, times and locations corresponding to times and locations of the measurements, but basically at any uh, uh, potential location. So it, this would also involve some uh, prediction at a certain stage. Now, all of this, of course, with the, uh, with the proper geodetic testing scheme huh, to be able to uh, remove uh, outliers, for instance, in our data, um, but also to provide not only an estimate of deformation or displacement, but also a quality description of uh, this uh, result. Now, and how, what is the, let's say, the overall uh, rationale of this approach? Um, Basically, what we do is we do the integration of our data sets of what we call the uh, common evaluation points. Uh, so we have a certain set of evaluation points where we actually perform the integration. And these may be uh, existing benchmarks, but these could also be, let's say, uh, uh, simulated locations uh, to align different data sets. I will get back to this uh, later. 
Now, the same holds in the time domain, uh, where we also have uh, our evaluation epochs, which again could be uh, existing epochs, uh, for instance, the epochs of a leveling campaign, um, but it could also be uh, uh, simulated epochs. And a third, let's say, commonality between uh, in, the, in the approach is at a common foundation layer. And there I mean, uh, let's say, the, also the sensitivity of the measurements uh, uh, to the different processes that go on in uh, different sub-layers of the Earth. I will get back to this as well. And hereby, of course, we would like to uh, make optimal use of the original sensitivity of the different data sets. Eh? So whether it's a 1D measurement, uh, 3D measurement, or in the radar, radar line of sight, we want to make try to make optimal use of these different sensitivities. Now, based on these common points and epochs, we do an integration, which results in a certain uh, estimated transformation parameters and, of course, uh, integrated uh, time series of displacement. And actually, this deformation or transformation parameters, um, we can then also apply back to the original data sets. That's the idea. And to make this a little bit more clear, I uh, sketch this, uh, this graphic to, to, to illustrate what we actually do. So on the x-axis, you see, let's say, the data processing steps. And on the y-axis, you see the data volume. Uh, and basically here you see four different stages in our uh, approach. So first of all, an in initialization where we start with the original data sets, the original data volumes, which may be in our data sets consisting of millions of, uh, of points. Eh? We saw examples uh, before, so, uh, such as the, this uh, data set of, of the UK. Uh, of course, that's a huge amount of data, uh, which we cannot in, uh, integrate uh, uh, in one in one go as a whole. So therefore, we do a certain data reduction, enabling us to actually integrate these different data sets. And once we have the transformation parameters, then we can start looking into generation of uh, outputs, which could be a map uh, or just at a certain location, an optimal estimate of the surface displacement. And as I mentioned, these transformation parameters, we can uh, uh, estimate uh, back to uh, the original data volumes at the end. That's uh, that's the idea. Um, now, just to go through the different steps that we take. First of all, we do an initial initialization of the data, meaning that we transform all the original data sets to a common data format, which we call the space-time matrix format, which uh, uh, allows us to store the original displacement data together with information on points and epoch level. And this could also contain uh, auxiliary information, as was presented uh, earlier this week on Tuesday by my colleague uh, Mark Bruna. So please have a look if you want to know more about this. So once we have everything in the same format, so the leveling, the INSAR, the GNSS in the same data formats, then we can start uh, uh, working on the on the uh, reduction. But also we have to take the, um, uh, the the common foundation layer into account. And what I mean here is that for instance, with INSAR, we are both sensitive to shallow and deep uh, cost uh, displacements. And so if, for instance, if we look in the Netherlands, where we are in a delta region with soft soils, we measure uh, both uh, effects of compaction as well as, uh, for instance, the effect of uh, gas uh, extraction or salt extraction. And since the total sum of the INSAR measurement contains both signals, but uh, whereas the, the leveling uh, benchmarks, for instance, are typically founded in well-founded objects, we actually want to separate those signals first to actually integrate uh, the different data sets at the correct foundation uh, level. So this is also what we do in our approach. And this is, of course, very relevant for delta regions such as uh, the Netherlands, but uh, I guess also in other parts uh, of the world. Now, and then this data uh, reduction, as I mentioned, we do this to e evaluation points. So these could be existing benchmarks, such as these leveling points in blue. But on top of that, we also simulate evaluation points, for instance, uh, to combine different insert data sets. Eh? So these are these uh, red points in this grid. These are uh, points that we created ourselves. The same thing we do for the evaluation epochs. 
And these are the, the, the positions where we uh, integrate the data sets. And then the INSAR and GNSS data sets are actually reduced to these uh, points and ebooks. Also, of course, taking their uh, positions uh, into account. And for that, please also, you can look back to the presentation of uh, Sami Esfahani earlier uh, this week on Monday, where he, uh, where he presented uh, a, a stochastic model for reduced INSAR data sets. So this is also what we use uh, here. Then to the integration. So what we do is we combine these different data sets, estimate uh, transformation and offset parameters, and of course also the displacement time series that uh, comes out of it, including the covariance matrix. And depending on the available data, we do the, this in, uh, in uh, a very clean east-north-up direction, but sometimes uh, we, we have to make assumptions because, for instance, with INSAR, we lack uh, proper information about uh, uh, deformation in the north direction, or we are very insensitive to that. So we may be able, we may need to make assumptions there, and that's what we indicate with near east and near up, or we stay in the line of sight of the INSAR data sets. And what's also important, we do a proper geodetic testing scheme, both on point epoch level, but also on individual measurements, and to identify uh, measurement points with a, with a problem or certain uh, measurement epochs which uh, uh, show uh, inconsistency. So we do a proper testing. Um, to illustrate this, here are some very um, basic uh, uh, graphics of what it looks like. So this is, for instance, histogram of normalized residuals for all these displacements of four different time uh, of data sets, uh, three intra data sets, one leveling data set. And these are the normalized residuals. So meaning, for instance, here that we have some outliers because we have um, measurements that are 40 to 60 times off the precision that is uh, associated with these measurements. Um, yeah, so this also results in the overall model test. So head uh, of the whole data set together. And there you see that before testing, you, would, you may get uh, overall model test values like this indicating that uh, the leveling data fits very well to the overall uh, system, but some of the INSAR data sets still uh, show some uh, offsets. If we then do the testing, eh, and uh, we also eh, we can also do this, uh, look into this spatially, and then we see that, for instance, some points uh, show uh, some anomalies, then we see uh, that we can detect those points and remove from our data sets. And then at the end, we have our uh, uh, data set without outliers and showing a much better uh, behavior overall for these different data sets. So this is the procedure of this integration and, uh, and testing uh, scheme. And then uh, we can go uh, over to the integration or the generation of actual uh, output. And these can have all kinds of formats, just as like a map, for instance, or uh, based on the list of coordinates. And as I mentioned, we would like to be able to do this for every, every location and epoch. So also uh, a, a certain a least square prediction or creeping step is uh, involved. Now, just to show you uh, a, a few um, the basic uh, outcomes of this, this is just to illustrate what it will bring. Uh, this is, let's say, the outcome of for one particular uh, radar data set. Uh, 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 rather than data sets, uh, and these illustrate the deep processes of such an uh, uh, interpolated map by prediction based on the original uh, measurement points uh, uh, reduced to these uh, evaluation points indicated by these dots, and you see uh, the, the result of the, uh, of the prediction. And as I mentioned, we wanted to separate in our approach also the deep processes or the subsidence due to the deep process from the subsidence due to shallow uh, compaction. And this is uh, the, the outcome here. And you see maybe some noisy uh, things there, but also some clear patterns of uh, features that show a stronger uh, shallow uh, process uh, than other regions. To summarize, um, what I would like, what I wanted to do is show you the, the methodology that we have developed to uh, to integrate these different uh, geodetic data sets. So not only INSAR, but also, for instance, GNSS leveling, but in the future also uh, gravity. Um, I showed you this approach uh, to use uh, these common evaluation points, and also that we will are able this way to do a full error propagation of all the errors associated with these uh, different data sets 
to the final outcome of this, uh, this approach. That was it. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, of course, uh, I'll, uh, I'm happy to answer those. So thank you, Fred. Uh, please, Ingvar. Yes, uh, then we are ready to uh, go on with the last um, presentation of uh, this slot. And that will be uh, given by Francesca Signa from uh, the CNR in Italy. Please. Hi, everybody. I'm trying to share my screen and remove this annoying window. OK, here I am. So thanks again for the introduction. So in this talk, I'd like to focus on one of the largest metropolises of the, of the world, and which is Mexico City, and to show you what the uh, most recent land subsidence rates are and how this subsidence is posing some risk for urban infrastructure uh, across the metropolitan area. As you probably know, uh, most uh, Mexican aquifers are overexploited because they provide 70% of the water demand for industrial uh, agriculture and human consumption. So um, water extraction is in excess of natural recharge, and many of these aquifers are in deficit, deficit, which means that there is no room absolutely to grant new pumping licenses. And in many, many cases, uh, the aquifer storage is uh, um, affected. For instance, in the metropolitan area of Mexico City last year, uh, they recorded um, a groundwater, uh, an aquifer storage change of more than 100 million of cubic meters per year. So this means that um, when the uh, aquifer deplate, you have land subsidence on, on the surface, which affects a number of such cities and all the cascading impacts of this process. As you can see from the photographs, there are huge damages in many buildings which are cracked or uh, tilt or bended. And also the um, transport infrastructure is heavily affected. And the serv serviceability of many of these infrastructure network is totally compromised. So this is uh, surely not the first one that somebody has used a satellite insert on Mexico City before. We screened uh, the entire literature and we found more than 70 papers published since 1999. So if you are one of those authors, so please don't be upset because we couldn't feature all the results in one slide only. But why is Mexico City so uh, central in, uh, in, in this field? Because uh, of the subsidence, pattern and because of its rates, uh, which uh, reach around 40 centimeters per year. For this reason, the city has been used a number of times uh, as a landmark or a test bed uh, to test new data, new SAR modes, like the TOPS mode uh, before the, the, the launch of Sentinel-1, but also testing new, uh, new methods. So despite the abundant literature, we found there are some scientific gaps to fill, uh, for instance, to provide a recent estimation of the land uh, compaction rates after 2018. Most importantly, to derive uh, information about the east-west uh, velocity field uh, computation, because only 2% uh, of the papers published have tried to, to do so and um, to make an assessment of risk posed by land subsidence and compaction to urban infrastructure for the whole me metropolitan area. To achieve these goals, we um, use the ESA's Geohazard Exploitation Platform, which is an online platform, a cloud-based environment, uh, with data, tools, and processing service, uh, services available to the scientific community to exploit satellite data for geohazard applications. And we did this work in the framework of the so-called geohazard laboratory initiative within uh, the activities of the CEOs working group on disasters. So 
To do our uh, SAR analysis, we uh, selected the parallel small baseline subset method uh, and uh, processing service that is available in the JEP. This is a parallelized version of the conventional SPAS technique, which is, uh, has been adapted by CNR IREA for uh, TOPS data parallelized and uh, made available in the JEP. As you can see um, from the plot to the right, there is a very detailed workflow and, uh, and about all the processing steps that are followed by this processing service that you can check in, the, in their publication, which is available uh, to the community. So here I'd like to show you the typical result of the processing by using uh, this tool and exploiting the full set of Sentinel data available in the archives. For instance, to the left, you see a map, which is an output of after processing with PSPAS, the full length of 6.5 years of data acquired over the city since uh, October 2014. Uh, as specified here, it took only one day and a half or, or a bit more than that from data selection to uh, data gathering from the on the dias processing and generation of the outputs. So the outputs are typically not only quick looks, so browsing images and legends that you can uh, display in Google Earth, but includes a full database with location, temporal coherence, and line of sight information, velocity, displacement time series for each coherent target, which is crucial information if you would like to do some post-processing and geological analysis and interpretation of these products. To uh, make a quality assessment of the products of, um, that you can get from uh, this tool, we run uh, an, an internal assessment of the quality of the data to estimate precision. And we found that the standard deviation of the line of sight velocity for the data that we processed was between 0 0.03 and 0 0.09 centimeters per year. And we also did a comparison uh, with external data, so GNS as data from uh, continuous station that acquired uh, across the metropolitan area to determine the accuracy. We found differences of around 0 0.1 and 0 0.9 centimeters per year across the, the full metropolitan area. It may look high, but actually it's not high if you think about the rates that we are looking at and the, the amount of displacement that is occurring across this area with time. So here uh, is the output um, of our processing and our combination of ascending and descending results for the period 2017-2019. To do this combination, clearly we had to make an assumption about uh, north-south uh, deformation velocities. We assumed that they were negligible, which was uh, particularly in line with observation from the GNSS data. So it was a quite robust uh, assumption in most of the area. To the left, you can see um, the vertical velocity field. And as you can see, there is a clear subsidence pattern reaching rates of 40 centimeters per year. Um, as you can see here, there's a main uh, feature of subsidence, and here the maximum subsidence uh, feature has been migrating uh, towards the east with, with respect to past observations from the city center, the old city center, and towards the center of ancient Lake Texcoco. Lake as you can see from the second map, this is the, an estimation of the east-west deformation field. Um, despite the pattern is not as predominant as uh, what we can see from the vertical data, in the horizontal data we can see some uh, deformation bands within the main subsidence bowl, and they uh, suggest movement occurring within the bowl towards the center uh, of the subsidence feature to, uh, and, the, and the maximum deformation rate. And this is perfectly consistent with theoretical models. When you compare these maps with the geological uh, data, and for instance, the surface geology of the region, you immediately see that there is a perfect correlation uh, between the subsidence pattern and the geology. Uh, in particular, the, the, the subsidence is occurring on top of lacustrine uh, deposits and alluvial deposits. These are from ancient lakes 
uh, like uh, Texcoco, Mexico Lake, and Chalco Lake that were started to dry out in ancient Aztec times to build the capital city. So it is only at those geological units that we see subsidence occurring. Uh, if we display the total vertical displacement uh, that we could estimate uh, in this period, uh, we displayed in 3D, it's quite clear that there is a, a, a shape that could be recognized uh, with all the different geomorphological and geological features that you see across the metropolitan area. One good observation that can be done is that every time you are on top of the so-called unit one of the geotechnical classification that was adopted by the government in 2004 and indicates hard rock um, of volcanic origin, Every time you are on top of that, you don't have basically any uh, motion seen from the satellite products. But once you move towards the transition zone, unit two, and into unit three, which is the, the unit with quaternary clay and silt rich deposits of the lacustrian uh, unit, you have some significant vertical displacement. To um, look at to, into this process a bit more into detail, we've uh, plotted a number of uh, cross sections. And it, as you can see here in dark, you see the vertical uh, velocity. In dark blue, you see the east-west velocity. And as you can see, every time you move from uh, the hard rock, through the transition zone and down into the, the lacustrian unit, you have an increase in the displacement rate. And you can also some, uh, see some peaks in the east-west uh, deformation field with the peaks exactly uh, located at the inflection points of the different subsidence poles. So uh, you may wonder what is uh, controlling the different rates within this unit. To answer this question, what we did was to compare our vertical velocity field with the total thickness of this uh, geological unit, uh, which, uh, as you can see from the map on the left, uh, in some portions of the, of the basin, which is uh, around 100 meters. Uh, this, uh, this sort of comparison was done in the past already by other authors who used uh, um, benchmarking data, so ground elevation measurements uh, acquired between 1993 and 2005. And what they found is that, is that there is a very uh, clear power function that can describe the relationship between the thickness of the lacustrine deposits and the vertical velocity. So we've done something similar with the um, Sentinel Peace bus results, and we found a similar power function that describes the results. But more importantly, we found the coefficient suggesting that with time, uh, the compaction rates are decreasing, which is in line of course, with the, the evolution of the consolidation process. Of course, uh, none of these uh, applications is taking into account the different consolidation conditions of the, of the deposits. So in these plots, you basically mix up uh, different phases of the consolidation. Initial phases where consolidation is more rapid and final stages where it's uh, slower. So you're putting everything together. So that's, uh, that explains the variability around these curves. So what can we do from this data to move from a purely geological process assessment into a hazard and then risk assessment? We need to take into account that every time you have subsidence, but not only subsidence, but differential subsidence across short distances, this is where um, the highest probability of development of surface faulting and fracturing is. So to quantify this, uh, this parameter, we computed the so-called angular distortion, so the ratio between the measured and differential displacement uh, between two points located at the distance L. And we did that by, uh, based on our vertical um, vertical uh, results. So what do we see when we compare this sort of products with uh, mapping uh, evidence from the field? We see that every time there is a high value for angular distortion, somebody has mapped uh, faulting or fracturing uh, uh, process in their building. So this is 
basically perfect parameter that we can use uh, to try to attempt a risk assessment analysis uh, of this process. So on one hand, we have information about the hazard, so the displacement rates uh, from the INSER analysis, and we have the right products of the angular distortions from the INSER analysis. And to the other side, we have information about the elements at risk that we could gather from a national database made available by the administrations and governments of Mexico. So for each of these polygons, which are uh, defined as geostatistical units in Mexico, we have information about the number of uh, population and number of properties uh, in each of these uh, in each, uh, polygons. So if we take into account these elements at risk, if we take into account as an information, we can try to make an estimate of risk. Uh, this is what we did by using a simple um, risk metric. So this is not a quantification of risk uh, in numbers, but it's a qualitative assessment, of course. So if you uh, intersect information from the satellite data through the computation of the angular distortions and information about elements at risk, for instance, the density of properties within each of these polygons, you can get um, output risk categories and we decided to classify the risk categories in five levels from very low to very high and this is how you can estimate uh, more or less the level of risk that is posed by differential subsidence across the metropolitan area. What we found uh, is represented in the histograms uh, to the right for the federal district. We found that more than three, uh, 300,000 properties and 1 million inhabitants are in zones at um, high and very high risk of surface faulting. While extending the assessment to the whole metropolitan area, this amounts to over a million and a half of inhabitants. So th these are figures that uh, the managers are taking into account when uh, planning for new constructions and uh, maintenance uh, actions. So to conclude, uh, this is a summary of what we can get from this study. So on one end, we have technical conclusions about our assessment of the JEP and its uh, processing services that uh, basically are providing the community with the opportunities for the exploitation of sentinel data to study geological hazards and then uh, use these products into their geological assessments, for instance, risk assessments. Mexico City, as it has done in the past, has acted also in these cases a test bed to assess the peace bus service um, in, and, and the value and the quality of its output products. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at the case study of Mexico City, we found, as uh, it was already observed in the past, that uh, the thickness of the lacustrine unit is the main factor controlling the, the patterns and the rates of the process, while the remainder of the, of the process is due to the depletion of the underlying granular aquifer. Of course, uh, the highest uh, risk is where you have a combination of the presence of elements uh, risk at the highest uh, and the highest transitions between uh, hard rock units and compressible units where the highest uh, angular distortions are. And these are the figures, unfortunately, of the affected population, which is around 8% uh, across the world metropolitan area. If uh, you'd like to know more, you have full details about this study in our paper, so please, uh, you can access that paper or I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Ingmar? That um, concludes uh, the presentations for today, and uh, we will move on to the to the Q and A session here. And I suggest we just start with the last author since she's already uh, um, there. And there, okay. there's, there is one question there: uh, Why is there a gap in the northeast area? I saw a few reports that cover these areas. Is there an impact of ESPOS for such gap? Uh, okay, if 
If you mean a gap in the data, uh, it mostly depends on the land cover of the region. So if there are no uh, urban areas or rocky outcrops, of course, uh, there is no way for a uh, multi-temporal insert to, to work, in particular the piece. But if you don't have uh, a good coherence across time, of course, you, you will not have any uh, coherent point, coherent targets uh, as in out, outputs of your uh, uh, analysis. If you mean a gap uh, on uh, in the risk map, it depends on the distribution of the geospatial, um, geostatistical units that are uh, identified by the government. So we restricted our analysis only to those uh, uh, urban units. So if you don't see a coverage in the risk map, uh, in, it, it's, it's due to that in that case. There is one more question for you. Did you also consider uh, the different building construction materials when evaluating the elements at risk? That would be great, actually. <laughs> we wish we could, but uh, uh, as far as we know, this is not an information that is publicly available in the database, but we are trying to investigate this uh, because, of course, we would like to try to differentiate the analysis depending on the typology of constructions to see if there is an influence in, in that sense and if uh, uh, weaker construction, uh, weekly, weekly construction strategies bring to more damage and uh, things like that. So we would love to, but at the moment we we are not aware uh, whether this data is publicly available. Good. Uh, the next question is for Giesinger. Uh, what effects on geolocation do you expect using reprocessed orbits? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, I know that there are now new reprocessed orbits available for Sentinel-1. They've been pushed now to this uh, GNSS hub. I think on the long run they will definitely have an, an impact, but it also depends a bit on, let's say, that the geolocation is, is more than just uh, the orbits. We have all the other effects. Um, we know from Terra's Rx studies that we can control very well external things like troposphere, ionosphere, tidal effects. So it, it's, I think it will come down to the to the systematic effects of the tops mode and also a bit on the on the data we are used. So I think for the strip map data, which unfortunately is only available for some very specific study sites, but I think there the the new orbits will definitely have an impact and but if we can also leverage that information for the IW data, this remains to be seen. I think on the long run, yes, but it's, it depends on how well we can control the other factors. Right. And the second question is, uh, could you give an estimate of how your uh, um, artificial reflector performs with respect to the traditional uh, uh, corner reflector? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Um, I mean, from our first assessment, I think that we have definitely advantages for the for the transponders or electronic devices. Um, so first one, this is definitely the bulk or the size. So uh, we've also seen in our installation that we can install these transponders at locations where we would not be able to place a corner reflector, let alone two corner reflectors, which we actually would require to, to do the same thing. So this is definitely good. Also, the, the signal strength seems to be somewhat higher than the usual 1.5 meter types that we are, that are already considered very big. So I think this is also definitely good. Uh, where I see the problems at the moment is definitely the let's say the reference point for the for well defined and tight tolerances for corner reflectors. We know really what you are measuring, and uh, we are measuring this also across the different uh, incidence angles. The face center of the corner reflector is, is well, well defined and can be connected also to, let's say, GNSS or other methods. Um, for the transponders, this is somewhere hidden in this, let's say, electronic and antenna-based construction. And unless the, the manufacturers do things like, you know, from the GPS community, like characterizing the antennas for all the different uh, incidence angles and, and tell us how the signals really can be 
put together into a physical location uh, that is connected with the transponders. Uh, until we have solved this these problems, I think we still have the advantage of the passive devices when we have the space and uh, the ability to place them. Right. We um, also have a question from Nantero. Um, will your method give any advantages in performance as compared to classical methods, for instance, where we can identify significant spatial PS velocity gradients? I ask this because your methods seem to detect deformation where the PS deformation velocities were significantly high. Hi, uh, thank you for your question. Um, the CNN uh, learned from the spatial patterns. So it will detect, for, for, if we set the, the, the probability threshold to 0.5, for example. So this method detects the, the size uh, as low as two millimeter per year. So um, I think it's, it's not that high, but um, the good thing about this is um, we compare to the trend on, traditional method. So if we set the threshold at two millimeter per year, for example. So um, in our method, we have about 300 sites that um, expert to check. But if you use traditional method, you have about uh, 5,000 sites. So the good thing about Simon is the um, part of that because it uses the spatial patterns and to make sure that that actually the deformation, not just a uh, um, uh, from the other um, random area. So that probably, I think that's the main advantage of the using the, the CNN. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I think we have uh, read all the questions. Uh, I have one question for everybody. Uh, which is the same I mentioned earlier, is uh, do we have any recommendation for ISA related to, the, to this session? Any comment is really welcome. I personally have a recommendation that is uh, to ISA when they ask uh, about uh, the requirement for a uh, for the future sentinel uh, sentinel mission my my requirement is uh, uh, just to keep the 100% compatibility between uh, the sentinel 1a and b and the and the forthcoming sentinels for many years coming from now so to avoid the the problem of the error of uh, ers with envisat Okay, will be really, really important to keep the continuity. I don't know if you have a comment on this. This is a good uh, point to bring in the technical discussion to uh, tomorrow, basically, Michele. So that would be, yeah. if you can send the, the requirement to end mail, we can incorporate it into the, to the PowerPoint. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's a good it's a good uh, seed question indeed, eh? because there there are are also other sides of the of the of the picture in the sense that uh, I understand your remark um, about compatibility. On the other hand, it stops let's say improvements in the sense that with with changing uh, the the settings, then you can get, get a better performance regarding uh, coverage and repeat cycle. So it's um, it's a trade off, but certainly a good uh, point to discuss in the technical session. My que practical question is: Who is going to present in the in the technical question in the technical session? Uh, <clears throat> so on technical session on Friday, uh, Julia Kudjanek she will be coordinating uh, you, and you chairs will become panelists. Uh, so basically, since there are four uh, subsidence sessions, out of the four subsidence sessions, one uh, or you can take turns, uh, each can uh, present their own uh, summaries. Otherwise, you should make one summary and present, uh, select one to, to present these uh, recommendations that pop out from the sessions. Okay. So, you know, you, you can uh, see between all the chairs of the 
of the subsidence uh, sessions. Okay. Uh, yeah. I can help over email. So I can help over end mail. I can put you all together, or if you can have a, a Skype call or something like that, then uh, this would help. Okay. Other questions? Any other recommendation? Well, if it is not the case, uh, we can probably close the session. This is exactly on time. Uh, there is another question now. Um, oh, okay. Uh, which is sort of related to what you just said. Uh, um, can we increase the orbital uh, tube of Sentinel-1 constellation for DM error correction uh, easier? It doesn't say... Uh, who the question is for, uh, but my view on that is that this is something that have been discussed at earlier uh, fringes, and uh, the general consensus has been what Michele just said that uh, the one hundred percent compatibility compatibility over time is uh, even more important. However, uh, in the case of one uh, C, which was maybe to be uh, done in parallel with Sentinel one A and B. It could have been an option to run it uh, with a different baseline for a while, but as far as I understood from the ISA sessions on Monday, uh, they will uh, not be running one scene in parallel. They will launch it and put it in uh, waiting mode, basically. Uh, but if anyone else in the um, in, in this um, slot of the uh, presenters have any comments, please. No, I think if our, uh, you're right, that has been, has been on the table before, um, but that doesn't mean, of course, that we cannot reassess uh, whether we would like to do something. And uh, what you mentioned about the 1C, yeah, so that's maybe an option, but also is indeed to, to uh, because I understood from Monday that there are like uh, 12 uh, orbits corrections per year or so, to, to relax that occasionally a little bit, to have a, a little bit bigger uh, baseline every now and then that would, for instance, for that uh, positioning of scatterers would be beneficial. Um, but of course, it's a it's a it's a good uh, it's a good seat question for the discussion uh, tomorrow. I think. Yes, uh, I think we can uh, continue this discussion uh, tomorrow for sure. It will come up again, and I think now we are three minutes over, so I guess it's uh, time for the lunch break, and we can probably give the word back to the organizers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you for much. the contribution. Yeah. Very much to all the speakers. Thank you for the chairs for the audience. Uh, so the technical discussion on the argument will uh, be tomorrow from 11.30 till 1. There's a technical session scheduled as from the program. And uh, there will, all the arguments can be tackled again. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah.